Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freyler, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to my YouTube channel and to Nerve Puzzle number four. This case is fictional and any resemblance to any particular person is purely coincidental. Let's start with the clinical scenario again. We have a 43-year-old man who's a right-handed mechanic and an eight-month history of tingling in the right little and ring fingers. He's been complaining of grip weakness and the symptoms have been present all the time now. It's not clear if and when it gets worse. On clinical examination, appearance shows reduction of muscle bulk in the hypothena eminence and the IDIO. Tone throughout the upper limb is normal and power is four minus out of five in the intrinsic hand muscles. Sensation is reduced to pinprick to digit five only with normal sensation in digits two and three. Let's think about differential diagnoses here. Could it be single nerve lesions? And let's work through them one by one. Could it be a median neuropathy? Well, that would be unlikely. The sensory loss is in the wrong distribution. Here we've got the little finger that's been affected and we've got wasting of the intrinsic muscles of the hands and we'd expect uh, wasting of the thenar eminence should the median nerve be involved. Could it be an ulnar neuropathy? Well, yeah, it certainly could do. Could it be at the wrist? Yep, that's a possibility. Could it be at the elbow? Yep, again, that's another possibility too. Could it be a brachial plexopathy, a little bit higher up? Well, that would be somewhat unlikely. We've only got a single nerve territory really that's involved here. Um, so that would argue against that. Could it be a radiculopathy, a C7-8 radiculopathy, for example? And the answer could be yes, well, it certainly could. Um, but we don't have features of neck pain within the history to particularly suggest that. So let's have a look now at the neurophysiology. We'll first have a look at the sensory nerve action potentials, the SNAPs. And if you haven't done so already, please do see my video on normative data. Well, the first thing we're going to see here is we've got a normal right median F2 SNAP, 14 and 56. However, if we have a look at the right ulnar finger five response, it's only got an amplitude of three microvolts. And there's a small degree of conduction velocity slowing here as well. It's about 40 meters per second. If we have a look on the other side, the other ulnar sensory response, we see that's 11 microvolts and 52. So it's clearly reduced in size and its amplitude. And also, it's also somewhat slowed the left median F2 response is normal and symmetrical to the right hand side. So, so far we can see a reduction in the right ulnar finger five sensory response and there's a little bit of conduction velocity slowing as well. I've also studied here the right dorsal ulnar cutaneous sensory response, which is very normal here at 1655, and it's symmetrical to the other side. We'll now have a look at the motor responses. The median responses are all very normal. We've got normal distal motor latencies on both sides. We've got normal conduction velocities in the forearm segment. So it's about 50 meters per second on both sides. The motor amplitudes are normal amplitudes and are symmetrical as well. But interestingly, we can see that the F latency is just a little bit prolonged on the right hand side, um, but nothing dramatically prolonged compared to the left. Is that of relevance? I don't know at this point. We'll then have a look at the ulnar responses. Well, the distal motor latency for the right ulnar response to the ADM is delayed. It's 4.6 milliseconds. That should definitely be less than 3.5 milliseconds. And if you look at the contralateral side, it's only 2.2 milliseconds. So there's significant prolongation of the time it takes the stimulus to travel across from the wrist and stimulate the ADM muscle. So there's definitely some distal slowing there. If we look more proximally on the right hand side, we can see the conduction of velocity in the forearm is very normal, it's 55 meters per second, and it speeds up as it goes across the elbow. And that's very normal and very appropriate. So there's no entrapment of the nerve around the elbow, which would give us conduction slowing over there. We have purely got a situation where the distal motor latency has been prolonged. It's now 4.6 milliseconds. Let's have a look at the motor amplitudes now and compare them to the other side. We can see here that the amplitude is 5.8 millivolts compared to 11.1 .1 on the other side. So very clearly here, we can see there's a reduction in the motor amplitude response and we've also got 
slowing distally across the wrist at 4.6 milliseconds for the ulnar nerve. Come to the F latency, this is clearly delayed at 36 milliseconds compared to the 29 milliseconds on the left hand side. So coming back to my original comment of the 31 milliseconds compared to the 29 milliseconds for the median nerve, this can sometimes occur with just natural variability and it's nothing to write home about, which is why I've included this in this particular uh, study. Let's refocus now on the stimulation of the ulnar nerve to the first dorsal interosseous muscle. Again, we can see a similar prolongation of the distal motor latency, 4.5 milliseconds, similar to that of the distal motor latency when we're stimulating the ulnar nerve to the ADM. And again, it's contralaterally delayed compared to the left-hand side. And the motor amplitude is also reduced compared to the left-hand side. It's 4.3 millivolts compared to 8.4. So summarizing the motor responses, we've got normal median motor conductions. Within the ulnar nerve, we've got distal slowing on the right-hand side of the ulnar nerve to both the ADM branch and to the IDIO branch and we can see for both of those there's a reduction in the amplitudes as well especially when we compare to the left hand side. Let's move on to the EMG now. So the right biceps is normal, that covers C5, C6. Triceps C6, 7, 8 is normal as well. Brachioradialis is normal, 5, 6. EDC, 7, 8 is also normal. APB, C8, T1 and that's normal. FCU interestingly is normal. What we can see is for the IDIO and the ADAM muscles, both ulnar innervated muscles, we've got fibrillations here, and we can see evidence, clear evidence of denervation being present and confirming the fact that we have an active process in the distal ulnar innervated muscles. So to summarize our findings, we've got reduction of the sensory response on the right hand side to the ulnar innervated fifth finger. We have sparing of the dorsal ulnar cutaneous branch. We have also got delay and reduction in that motor amplitudes of the ulnar nerve distal segments to the ADM and to the IDIO muscles with no effect on the around elbow conduction. In conclusion, we've got a moderate right distal ulnar neuropathy at Guyon's canal and otherwise normal findings. As with all my previous videos, I always like to make a clinical point and a neurophysiological point. Distal ulnar neuropathies are actually quite rare and they tend to be caused by ganglions at the wrist. There are some hobbies, some professions which can predispose to this. So for example, mechanics, if they're busy thumping their wrists on uh, spanners to knock them down, then that can actually aggravate a distal ulnar neuropathy, which is why I chose this as the profession of this case. Um, certain hobbies, such as long distance cycling, where there's pressure on the handlebars for long periods of time, can also increase pressure over there and uh, provoke this condition as well. And if you want to have a look, I've got a lovely video explaining this condition in more detail. The dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve is incredibly useful in differentiating this condition from a higher uh, point of compression, for example, a ulnar neuropathy across the elbow, or in fact a lower trunk uh, plexopathy or uh, medial cord plexopathy as well. Um, the origin of this nerve is actually proximal to Guyon's canal, and so it is unaffected in the distal ulnar neuropathies. Neurophysiology can actually be very useful to pinpoint the exact zone in which the nerve entrapment is occurring. In zone one, which is within Guyon's canal, all three branches of the ulnar nerve are affected. So we've got a reduction in the sensory response. We've also got prolongation of the response to the FDIO muscle and also to the ADM muscle as well. If it's a zone two issue, then that's just around the point of the hook of hamate, and there only the deep branch is affected, and we'll only see changes in the IDIO muscle. And of course, zone three is the rarest of the lot, uh, where only the sensory branch is affected. 
Thank you so much for watching, and I hope this has been interesting. Please do support this channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video puzzle too.